الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم he received the wahi and this is the beginning of the revelation of the last message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to makhluk, yani to the creation. So this is yani, a, a historic moment that you could not uh, yani, pay enough respect and attention to because this is the purpose of creation, to know your Lord, to know Allah, to know your purpose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His mercy, He sent us these messages. Yani, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Torah or the Injil or the Zubur or the Quran, this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't reveal anything to us, we would still be obligated to believe in a creator. And there are enough signs around us and in our body, in ourselves and in the world that we could recognize that there is a creator. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His mercy revealed these messages. And every message was revealed with hikmah, with wisdom in the right time, in the right place. So it would be applicable for the people of that time and place. If the Torah was, for example, for all times and all places, the people had not reached these places. But in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, mankind had reached different areas. I mean, there were ships going to China and things like this all the way across. And this message, the Sahaba radiyallahu would take it to all over the world. And in that time, you would see that message would not just be in the Arabian Peninsula, even during the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba radiyallahu they went like Sa'ad ibn Waqqas radiyallahu took it all the way to China. Many of the Sahaba, their graves you will find in Europe, in Africa, in, in parts of Asia and so on. But the beginning of that last final message, this is such a historic moment in the history of mankind. Here Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when this was revealed to him and he went back to his wife, he said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, cover me. And he, when, when a very hard task or a big responsibility is put upon a person, when you really realize it and you feel it, many people you start shaking. You may not realize it, you know, because most of us live a, a very ordinary life. Like we don't really have those kinds of things. But people, for example, that are launching uh, satellites and things, you know, when, they, when they're in that final moment, you see some of them, the stress makes you shiver. Okay? Now the Prophet ﷺ at this time, he has seen Jibreel السلام, in his real form. And he has and he been given a task that he's starting to now understand. He just got home, but he's starting to understand, so he's shaking. Here, Khatija radiallahu anha, she is consoling him, she is give, comforting him, she is advising him. Some of the ulama, they said at this time, certain ayat were revealed. Which are, Ya yuhul muzzammil, qum al-layla illa qalila. And, Ya yuhul mudathir, yani, qum fa'andir, right? There is khilaf ulama when these were exactly revealed. Most likely what we see, Ya uh, Yahul Muzammin, Qum al Layla illa Qalila is revealed around this time. And then Ya Yahul Mudathir later. We'll talk about that, inshallah. But these two are definitely from the early revelations. Not the whole Surah, uh, Surah Mudathir and Muzammin, but these beginning ayat. What is the relationship? Because see, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He recited it, he said it, he ordained it upon Luh al Mahfub in one shot. Then he revealed it from the Luh al Mahfub by his will to Baytul Izza, that is in the last sama in one night, in Laylatul Qadr. So, in the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have revealed the whole Quran in one night upon the Prophet. But imagine if that had happened. See, look at the hikmah of our Creator, the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that had happened, first thing, we would never understand asbab al-nuzul. And we would never understand context. Which ayat are about jihad, which are about not jihad, what are about safar, what are about being muqeem, what are about, yani, none of that would be understood. Because all be in one night. Right? 
But when ayat are revealed with context of what's going on, then we know, okay, these rulings have to do with war. These have to do with peace. This has to do with traveling. This has to do with being a resident. These have to do with this and that because of what's going on. Context. Right? And how could the Prophet ﷺ take all that? Like a human being, he's still a human. The whole Qur'an in one night, and that would have been very difficult. This is kalamullah, this is not something light. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from his wisdom, he revealed the ayat with asbab, yani with reasons of what was going on. So people would understand the context. Now here these ayat give us a beautiful yani, uh, understanding of what is the responsibility of the Muslim, the Mu'min, the Da'i in the day and night. Right? Ya ayyuhal muzammil, this tells us the responsibility of the night. What is that? Qum al layla illa qalila. Stand in the nights except a little. And this is a da'i, a mujahid, somebody striving and struggling for the sake of Allah. The prayer and dua and standing in solitude where nobody sees you and nobody knows, that is your fuel. That is what gives your da'wah yani, effect. So that is your job at night. And what about the day? Ya yuhal mudathir, qum fa'andir. Get up, go out, and warn people. Right? So in the daytime, calling people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, warning people of the day of judgment, warning people that they have a purpose in life and so on. And at night, making that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the early part of the da'wah, he's been given these two. Respons the responsibility of the night and the responsibility of the day. Right? Khatija radiallahu anha, as we discussed in the last dars, she told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah will honor you, Allah will never let you be misguided, you're somebody who's honest, you're somebody who keeps the ties of relations. She mentioned all these, and this is a beautiful yani, example for our sisters. How to support the da'wah. Everybody has their own role to play. Today the problem is people forgot their roles. Right? Brothers, you're supposed to be leader, you're supposed to be stepping up. Instead, you see brothers sitting at home, any, wasting time, doing nothing, not concerned with even the, the family, not concerned with the religion, not concerned with da'wah, not concerned with Amr bin Maruf and Nahal Munkar, just living as if you, you're not a man. Any, you're a male, but not a man. Any, this is a, a, a role that you forgot. May Allah protect us. Right? And our sisters who are the ones that supported the da'wah, the ones that, that really, I mean, look at Khatija radiyanha, she was instrumental for the da'wah. Right? But her instrumental was not that she went out and, and said, Hey Abu Jahl, come on me and you. <laughs> I can do anything a man can, let's take get it on. <laughs> no. <laughs> she had that role of a comforter, she had that role of encouraging the Prophet of, 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 of a man, he looks for uh, yani ease at home. That's how it works. And a man, when he goes outside, he puts on a face. I'm, I'm revealing secrets here for the guys. Sorry, guys. Right? right? He wants to be tough. He wants to, other men, we have whatever issues go on, you, you act tough. When you go home, this is where you open your heart. This is where you can feel comfortable and yani speaking because that wife is that, is that libas. She is that covering for you as you are for her. So here Khatija radiyanha, she told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that, look, I'm with you, in many words, or you're fine, but let's find out about this. And who would know? She said, I have yani, a cousin, Ibn Am, yani, he is a cousin of Khatija radiyallahu anha, and his name is Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Waraqa ibn Nawfal, uh, as Ibn Hajar has mentioned in Fath al-Bari, his name is Waraqa Ibn Nawfal, Ibn Asad, Ibn Abdul Uzza, and he was Ibn Am Khatija radiallahu anha. And there is a backstory which is mentioned in a hadith, and I'm mentioning from a few different a hadith. Waraqa Ibn Nawfal and a few other people in Mecca were not satisfied with the shirk that was going on. They did not want to be involved in shirk. They saw shirk to be wrong, even though 
there was no nabuwa of the Prophet ﷺ at that time. Right? Why? Because the fitrah shows people shirk is wrong. I mean, sometimes when we speak to people at the table and stuff, the people that aren't tainted by brainwashing towards shirk, and you tell somebody like, like do you believe God came out of a woman or, 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 or a monkey can be worshipped and things? And I'd be like, no, that doesn't make any sense. And you tell them, what about a one great creator that created us, that's not a man, that's not a woman, that's, that's the creator of everything. And every, it makes sense because the fitrah is there. So these people are Ahlul Fitrah. These are the people upon Fitrah. They did not worship idols. They rejected idol worship. But they didn't know what to do. From them is Waraqah ibn Nawfal. And these are the names mentioned in a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa From them is Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh. From them is Qus ibn Sa'dah. From them is Zayd ibn Amr. From them is Uthman ibn Hwayrith. So these were people between the time of Isa ibn Maryam and the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, but they were people on Tawheed. They were people on the people of Fitrah. Now many people want to take others and put them in this category because of their ta'asub or because of their love or gulu and stuff. They want to take Abdul Muttalib, they want to put him here, they want to take the Father of Rasulullah put him. But these are mentioned in a hadith where Rasulullah ﷺ was asked, and I'll mention some of those ahadith about these people. And he explained about it. So if we don't have a hadith on this, then we don't just take somebody and go, ah, I think they were. No. Right? So, Waraqa ibn Nawfal, Zayd ibn Amr, Uthman ibn Hawayrat, these people, they wanted to find a true religion. And the spiritual capital at that time was Sham. Sham had Christians, it had Jews, and I mean, they had idol worship as well. But there were people on a better path than the pure mushrikeen. So these people, they went to Sham. Uh, Zayd ibn Amr, and we spoke about him earlier when he met with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi and both of them, the Prophet also didn't do shirk, right? So Zayd ibn Amr was their leader. They were in the jama'ah. And when they went, they asked who are the knowledgeable people here? So they were sent to a Yahudi. A rabbi. And he told the Yahudi that we want to enter your religion. Like we don't want to worship idols. We know idol worship is wrong. And you guys worship a creator. We want to enter your religion. Now th these reports, many of them are from these people themselves. That they narrated to people that, from the Sahaba. Who later became Muslim and narrated these reports. Right? So they themselves report this. So they said the Yahudi, yani, whatever... He may be upon, he was honest enough to tell them, he said, you cannot enter our religion without you taking on a part of the ghadab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's very interesting, right? Many people know what they're upon is false. Right? But there is nationalism, there is we are the chosen people, we are this, we are that, there is communal pressures, there's all these kinds of things that hold people back from the truth. Okay. I mean, even today, subhanAllah, you will see on the, the One Message channel, sometimes you'll see in the debates, we'll tell somebody, if we can show you, prove to you clear contradictions and errors in the Bible, will you then leave Christianity? They'll say no. Even when they know it's falsehood, they will say no. Because hidayah is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Some people, they're not about right and wrong. Many of the people of bid'ah in our ummah are the same, but you show them something is bid'ah with a dilla, Quran, sahih, a hadith, they still don't want to leave it. Why? Because not everybody has that want to be, yani what is called in some other languages, haq parast, yani somebody who wants to follow the truth. Right? Some people, they just, want to, they just want to be in that circle that they're in. Meaning if you're, if you're born a Hindu household, you're going to fight for it, you're going to kill Muslims, you're going to do all these things for what? Monkeys? Blue guys? What? Rats? Right? No, you know that's all fake, right? And you know those stories are just cultural stories made up. You know there's no 12-headed, elephant-headed, whatever things. But it's just a cultural issue. Right? Some people, they will, 
They will see things with their own eyes that is against, they'll, they'll tell you, there is a, 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 like when I was in Hawaii, we were talking to some of the local people, and they talked about some of their beliefs, and we're like, you really believe that? Like there's a God over there that made, you know, this and that? They're like, yeah, not really. But that's our belief. <laughs> what does that mean, right? So, the Yehudi here, he knew, and he was honest enough to tell them, right? So they said, look, we, we, we didn't come to you except to get away from the ghadab of Allah, and from the punishment of Allah. So if we're going to get a part of the punishment of Allah, we're not going to join this. He said, what should we do? They said, be on deen al-Hanifa. Be on the deen, the religion of Ibrahim, not the Hanafi Mahdab, don't get excited guys. Right? This is the deen al-Hanifa, is the madhab or the deen or the methodology of Ibrahim alayhi salam, which was Tawheed. Which was to believe in one of oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No children of Allah, no uh, any corruption in aqidah, just belief in oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Islam, this is that belief. So here, some of them, yani from this group, they said, then we should just go back. Some of them, said, let's talk to others. So they found from the Christians, a priest. And they told them the same thing. They said, look, your Nabi, yani Isa ibn Maryam, he came afterwards. So we want to follow the same religion. We want to be entered into religion. He told them, he goes, you know, today, our people have changed the religion so much, you cannot enter it except that you will get a part of the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, once again, they said, we don't want to enter and gain the punishment of Allah. We came to run from the punishment of Allah. So they went back, but they went back with some ideas. Waraqa ibn Nawfil took a lot of the teachings of Isa ibn Maryam, but in the correct way. Meaning he didn't worship Isa ibn Maryam. He didn't worship Jesus. But he took some of those teachings and he, he knew a lot of languages, so he would read in different languages and translate into Arabic and so on and so on. And others like Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh and Zayd ibn Amr, they just worshipped Allah upon Deen al-Hanifa, yani whatever they could find from the religion of Ibrahim salam, they just worshipped Allah. But these people are people of Jannah. They are people who were saved. Why? Because they did not make shirk. And we have adilla, we have evidences, which we'll talk about inshallah about this. Tayyib. So Waraqa ibn Nawfal, this happened, yani this hadith we're talking about is early, early on. At this time, he's very old. Yani time has passed. So when Khatija radiallahu anha went to him with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi she said, Ya ibn Ammi, O oh my cousin, isma'a min ibn akhik. Listen to the son of your brother. And this is a term of respect. Yani, meaning listen to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained what happened to Waraqa ibn Nawfal. He told him the whole story, what had happened so far. And so far, it was just what had happened in the Ghar, and he with Jibreel alayhi salam, and the beginning of Wahid. Here, Waraqa ibn Nawfal, he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Ya ibn Akhi, and O oh, son of my brother, Hada Namus. This is a name, Namus was one of the names for Jibreel alayhi salam. And he said, Alladhi anzala Allah ala Musa. This is the same angel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to Musa alayhi salam. Now, this is something interesting. You have somebody who's multilingual, well-versed, who knows the scriptures, who knows the Old Testament, who knows the New Testament, and all that was there. And all, with all of that knowledge that he has, and the scriptures that were there at the time, he recognized the Prophet ﷺ. Now what is being passed as the New Testament and Old Testament today? What we see today from the Greek works and songs, has been changed so much that that original message of Isa ibn Maryam has been washed out of it. And you have some aspects of it, you still see the Ten Commandments and the belief in one Allah and things like this. But so much has been changed as just the opinions of men. But we do see that at that time, many of the Christians and the Yahud, and we'll talk about that inshallah later in the seerah as well, as many of the Yahud that saw in their books clear signs that led them to believe in the Prophet sallallahu Waraqa ibn Nawfal, he said, Ya Laythani, fiha jad'a, yani shaban. 
He says, I wish I was jada'a, yani, I wish I was young. He said, why? He said, because nobody has come with such a message except that his people have turned against him, turned him out. Right? I mean, even subhanAllah, you look at Musa alayhi salam, bin Israel betrayed him so many times. Right? If you look at Isa alayhi salam, the people around him betrayed him. And you look at the same, seeing that pattern, he knew the same would happen to Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was shocked by this. Why? Because people loved him. And he was known as Amin and Sadiq and everybody loved him and he had no problems with anybody. He wasn't involved in any kind of inner tribal war or anything like that. Even when they came to uh, put the black stone in his place, they were all happy at him. And he, a young man, not from the chiefs of Mecca and so, but they still had such respect for him because of his honor, because of his honesty, because of his great character, that he knew his people loved him. He said, how can my people... Turn on me. This is, this is all, you know, the tribal society, that's all you have. That's all you know. But Waraq Abdel Nawfal told him that this is what happens. When you have this responsibility, know that the people will turn on you. And this is a great lesson for us. There are some people, I'm not going to mention any names, MTJ, but Everybody likes them, right? Like you, you go to people of bid'ah in their conferences, they ask him to speak. The Rafada, the, the Shia ask him to speak. The people here, why? Because he doesn't speak the truth. What does he do when he sees you that you are a person of bid'ah? He will speak in a way to praise your bid'ah, even if not explicitly. Right? He will not say, this is bid'ah, this is wrong, tawheed. No, he will say, you know, you love Rasulullah so much. Oh, it's so beautiful. I love green. <laughs> right? When he sees uh, the people of, of yani, shirk that go towards ghulu and things like this in another way, he will not go to them and say, how come you can be worshipped other than Allah? How can you be asking from other than Allah? He will go to them and say, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, radiallahu anhum. And then he will not say, then he will say, alayhi salam. And then he will just praise them in a way to try to earn Favor from everybody. And that kind of a person everybody loves. But this is somebody not loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the, those that are loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are those that speak the truth. And this is a principle, remember this. Sufyan Athawri, one of the earlier imma, he was told about somebody. He said, this person, everybody loves him. He said, this is a, he said in that case, this is a man who's never spoken the truth. When you speak the truth, Allah will love you. And the mu'minun, the believers will love you. The believers will love you. It's not like you're going to be hated by everybody. No. The believers will love you. But the munafiqun, the kuffar, the mushrikun, the mulhidun, all of them will hate you. Which is the majority. And when you speak just to earn people's favor, then Allah will not love you. And the mu'minun will not love you. But the mushrikun, the munafiqun, the mulhidun, the every other <laughs> ism that's out there will love you. You will get invited to places that others won't. You will get uh, yani, grants and money and security and this and that and all of that. Every kafir will be wanting to put you on lists for the most influential, most this, most that. Why? Because they want to encourage that. Right? But you know, you know in your heart when you are on the haq and when you're not. Waraq ibn Nawfal, as we mentioned, he was from the people of Fitra. Was he a Sahabi? And he, did he bring Iman in the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi to the level that we can consider him from the Sahaba? There is khilaf of ulama. Imam al-Tabari Al-Baghawi ibn Qa'in, uh, Qani' uh, ibn Uthaymeen, Shaykh Muhammad Saleh ibn Uthaymeen, Shaykh Saleh al-Fawzan, Ibn Sakin and others, they took him to be from the Sahaba. 
They said, أَوَّلَ آمَنَ بِهِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ خَتِيجَ رضي الله عنها وَمِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَرَقَ بْنَ نَوْفًا You can look at the Majmu al-Fatawa of Shaykh Ibn Uthaymeen uh, and you will see his evidences and so on. But the Jumhur al-Ulema, like uh, Al-Hafiz ibn Kathir in Bidaw al-Nihaya, Imam al-Dhahabi in Tiyar al-Alam al-Nubala, Ibn Hajar al-Sqalani in Al-Isaba, and if you look at the earlier A'imma and ulema they said he was from Ahlul Fitra, but he was not from the Sahaba. Tell you why not? Because at this time, he did not make shirk, and he said, if I'm alive, if I'm alive, at that time I would support you, but he died very early. He never got to know the Risala of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they say that he is not from the Sahaba. That's why they said, أَوَّلَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِهِ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ أَبُو بَكْرِ الصَّدِّيقِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ هذا قول راجع. This is what is correct. Because to be considered from the Sahaba, you have, يعني, to be a, bring Iman upon the Risala of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but at this time, and it's very early on. So, here you have Waraqa ibn Nawfal. No doubt he's from the people of Jannah. I mean, we don't have any doubt. Why? How can we say that? How can we guarantee that? Because in the hadith of Aisha, when she asked Rasulullah about Waraqa ibn Nawfal, he says, I saw him with a, in a dream wearing white, white thiyab, white clothes. And he said, if he was from the people of Anad, he would not do that. Which is a, 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 a method of dream interpretation as well. And, and again, I don't want you guys to take this and start interpreting people's dreams. You're not at the level. Don't do it. right? But when the ulema who do specialize in this, they take these types of adilla. But then they look at the situation, obviously. But this is a dalil. If you regularly, if you see somebody in a dream wearing white clothes, this is a good sign for them. Right? Another hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu said, Do not curse Waraqa ibn Nawfal. For verily I saw him, walahu jannah wa jannatan. Yani, I saw him and he has a jannah or another way, two jannahs. So these hadith tell us that no doubt Waraqa ibn Nawfal is in jannah. We do not guarantee jannah except for who we have adilla for. And we do not guarantee nar except for who we have adilla. We have the zahir of it. Yani the zahir of it, every Muslim is going to Jannah. Zahir of it, every kafir is going to Jannah. But there could be somebody we see as a Muslim in his heart, he's a munafiq, he's a kafir, yani a full munafiq, and he goes to nar. But that's between him and Allah. It's not for us to be like that puna, pick that. He's going to Jahannam. How do you know? No man, I knew that guy, he's a munafiq. Who, who made you responsible? Or somebody, he, wallah, he's in Jannah. People, you know, at, at the Janazah, there's like a new bid'ah now. They have to give like a little speech about this person and like, like the kuffar of the eulogy, what do they call it, right? They do the same thing at Janazah. This guy, he was so honest. He is from the people of Jannah. From the, how do you know? Who put you in charge of Jannah? Right? But this person here, now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said about him particularly and many of the others that I mentioned from Ahlul Fitra. Hence, we can say no doubt to it. I want to mention a point before I move forward. Waraqa ibn Nawfal was trying to follow the true religion of Isa ibn Maryam. And he was a Zahid. He was somebody, a person of Zuhud. A person who didn't love this dunya. Who was attached with the Akhirah. Somebody who was searching for the truth. And there is another one that we'll talk about later in the Seerah, in the Medinan period. His name is Abu Amir al-Rahir. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called him Abu Amir al-Fasir. Abu Amir was also a Zahir. And he was also trying to follow the message of Isa alayhi salam. See? So both of them, they are outwardly the same. Meaning both of them are trying to follow the true message of Isa ibn Maryam. Both of them don't love this dunya. Both of them were known for good character. Both of them were praised by the people for being يعني, spiritual and pious. But one of them we know is in Al-Jannah. And one of them, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said he's from the people of the Hellfire. What's the difference? What of Qabr al-Nawfal? When he saw the truth, he accepted it. Abu Amir al fasiq when he saw the truth, he fought it. Why? Waraq ibn Nawfal, he didn't have that kibber, that, tr- that pride. Because think about it, right? A person of pride, 
would say, why did Allah choose him? I'm a scholar. I know so many languages. I know the Old Testament. I know the New Testament. I know the Torah and Injil. And I know the, the writings. And I'm somebody for so many years. I'm so old. I've been worshipping that one Allah and this. Why, why Allah didn't choose me? Why Allah chose him? He can't even read or write. Right? But he didn't. He, 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 he was able to suppress his nafs, his desires. And he said, if Allah chose him, khalas. And Allah accepted. He, I accepted. Abu Amr al-Fasi couldn't. Even though apparently he had zuhud. And that's why I don't go by looks. And you see somebody dressed really bad. and <laughs> They shake hands. <laughs> As if that's zuhud. La, shake hands like a man. Don't break my hand or anything. <laughs> Some of us get carried away. But hey, dress nice. This is the sunnah. Right? Have zuhud in your heart. When Allah chooses somebody over you, then khalas, Allah chose that person. My job is to follow him. Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu, he was no doubt the most qualified. Amr radiallahu sent a letter, Abu bin Jarrah is the leader now. Khalid radiallahu anhu didn't say, what? I'm better than him, I'm stronger than him, I'll fight it out, let's duke it out, whoever wins gets it, no. He didn't say, khalas, I'm not going to fight next to you then. He didn't say, I'm going to take my guys and I'm going to revolt. No, he said, khalas. Amir al-Mu'minin said, khalas. Where is the regular armor? I'm a regular soldier. So this is a very important point. Abu Amir al-Fasiq, he was a rahib. He was known for zuhud. But when he saw that Rasulullah was chosen, he said, why him? Should have been me. And he fought against the Prophet That's why he's from the people of the Naam. And these all things have lessons for us. We have the same things today. Allah gives somebody superiority, everybody else. Why him? I was, I was doing this before him. I was better than him. <laughs> Subhanallah, I was on a, a podcast long time ago. Don't try to, it's not recent. And we were waiting in the waiting room before it went live. And there was a brother, it was very, I mean, I, I was very new at podcasts and things. I didn't even know the brothers on there. And the brother said, oh, we saw your video. I said, oh, mashallah. And he goes, why Allah made you so popular? <laughs> what? I don't know. <laughs> he goes, you know, I've been, I've been out of this park and this place. I've been doing this for years. I don't know why people watch your videos. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. <laughs> I'll watch yours instead. But, you know, whatever, right? But this is the thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses who He wants. And this is a part of the test that's upon us. Warqa ibn Nawfil, he died very early on. Um, and this is one of the misconceptions a lot of people have. What do they have? That Waraq ibn Nawfal, he's the one that wrote the Quran. Right? The Christians and Jews and atheists, they always try to come at this angle. Oh, he, the Prophet he, he got the Quran from Waraq ibn Nawfal. The first thing, there's no evidence for that. Like there's no historic evidence. Waraq ibn Nawfal didn't write any books. We don't have any evidence. He wasn't a poet. Even though he knew the other scriptures, but he had no writing. And things. So there's no evidence. But even if you leave that, let's take it a step further. We know according to the consensus of the historians, Muslim and non-Muslim, that Walaq ibn Nawfal died before even a single surah was completely revealed. Like only a few ayat, even the rest, of the rest of the ayat had not been revealed yet. And that is why many of the Sahaba, many of the ulama didn't consider him a Sahabi because he didn't even learn any of the Sharia, ah, any of the ahkam that came to the Prophet ﷺ. What is correct is that he only heard about Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. That's it. That's all he heard about, right? So, He's very early. If he wrote the Quran, then who wrote the rest of it? <laughs> right? I mean, that, that doesn't make sense. Because he's already dead before 98.9% or whatever percent you want to take of the Quran is revealed. Right? That's the first. Secondly, if he wrote it, why don't he take credit for it? <laughs> I mean, why don't he say, I'm the Messenger of Allah? I mean, imagine if I write a really good book or something, I'm not going to be like, Asadullah wrote it. <laughs> You're like, man, I spent years on this thing. Why, why am I going to do that? Right? So it doesn't make sense. Right? Because they cannot answer the miraculous nature of the Quran that how could something so eloquent, so beautiful have been revealed to somebody who can't even read and write. Because of that, they tried to find excuses, but they're childish. Waraq ibn Nawfal died very early on. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had some of the Quran revealed to him. 
But a period began where there was no wahi coming. Some other ulema said this was three years. But that's a weak opinion. I mean, a very, very weak opinion. I looked at the rawayat and stuff. There is no standing for it. Some other ulema said six months. But what is correct that this was a few days. It was not a very long period of time. But in this time, no wahi was coming. Now there is a hikmah, there is a wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The wahi coming was not something easy. Like this is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So physically, it was tiring. And even, and we'll talk about the different ways the wahi would come to the Prophet sallallahu But some of the sahaba, they would say that Rasulullah would be sitting on my lap, and his, I mean, his head would be on my lap. And when the wahi would come, he would, he would become so hot that I would feel that my legs are going to burn up. And the, the pressure that he had would make me feel like my legs are going to break. Right? I mean, this is something very heavy. Thaqeel. So if all of it just started coming one, maybe he couldn't handle it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew better. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed some and then he gave him this break. And also to develop a love. I mean, this is a hikmah. You know, sometimes... When you want to push something even that's very good down somebody's throat all at once, then they, they reject it. But if you let them taste a little bit of it, and then stop, then they will want more of it. Right? That's why it's not from the sunnah, and not from the way of the sahaba radiallahu anhum, to do durus every day. The sahaba radiallahu anhum, as we see some riwayat from them, they would only do dars once a week or twice. Right? And I mean, of course that's not a hukam, but this is their way. Why? Because sometimes what happens in some of the masajid, every day we have ta'aleem from uh, this hour to this hour. I mean, mashallah, man, they, for two hours every day they're reading some book filled with fabricated hadith and so right? But then what happens is, everybody's asleep. I was in another city, I won't mention the name of the city, that's where I'm from, right? And I was going from, uh, through a marketplace, there was a masjid, I stopped to make salah, I made salah. And then one of the brothers said, oh, we're having ta'aleem. Can you sit with us? I felt shy. They said it's from hadith. So I sat down. I didn't know what book they were reading and stuff. I had an idea, but I wasn't sure. Right? So I sat down. The first thing I noticed is as soon as the person started reading, I looked around, they were all asleep. All. Like, Man, this is your qayruda time or what? Right? The person reading is going, what are you doing? What benefit is that? Oh, Sakina is coming down. Go home. Put your head on the bed and Sakina will come down as well, inshallah. <laughs> the dars is not a place for Sakina for you to go to sleep. A dars and the, when the call Allah, call Rasul is being said, this is the place to listen and benefit and to think and to change. And he, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave this gap. Right? In this time, the Prophet sallallahu he was, يعني, uh, he became very anxious. Why? Because at first, when a big responsibility is given, a person becomes afraid. We see that in the, in the way the Prophet ﷺ acted when he ran home and things. And then, when you realize the benefit to mankind, when you realize what it means, then you become يعني, uh, anxious to do it. So here now the Prophet ﷺ, he wants to now uh, go forward with this. But now there's no way he coming for a period of time. So he contemplates, he starts to يعني, get to his mind. He says, maybe I should just jump off a, a, a mountain or something. Regarding this narration, I mean, some of the ulema considered it da'if and so on. But even if you don't, even if you take it as authentic, it's not that the Prophet went and killed himself. But he was going through that internal strive. And he's a human being. And here Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and told him, you are the haq, Nabi of Allah. And then... After a while, Jibreel alayhi salam now began the wahi again. And this is a hadith reported by Jabir radiyan from the Rasul alayhi salatu salam himself that he said, I saw Jibreel in the sky sitting on a chair, and he, in the sky. And I knew this was Jibreel, he was in the form as I had seen him. And then he revealed to me, Ya yu al-mudathir, qum fa'andir wa rabbaka fa'kabbir, and so on. I mean, the beginning of the orders that were given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Oh, you wrapped up, shaking, right? Well, we take al muzammil and mudathir here together. Qum fa'andir. And you get up and warn people. Now look at that message. 
the importance of da'wah. Today, everybody here wants to just get along. They just want interfaith, hold hands, hug, you, you work you for my cause, I work for yours. What about warning people, look, a day of judgment is coming. You're making shirk, I don't care if you're going to politically vote with me or not, you're making shirk, you're going to go to Jahannam. Like da'wah is not because we just want to grow our community. Da'wah is because we don't want people to go to the north. This is the responsibility to warn people with hikmah, with basira, no, but still do it. وَرَبُّكَ فَكَبِّرْ And what do you want to call towards your Rabb? You want to praise your Rabb. Not don't call towards yourself. Don't be like, you know, in my PhD, I did this, and I, I read the Bible, and I found it so beautiful. I read this, and you just want to impress people with yourself. That's why we see a lot of quote-unquote du'at. They're out there, and they, they'll, you know, they, they'll get whatever, Ali, or whatever his name is, you know, be out there just trying to impress people. Selling out the aqidah, selling out the ahkam and hudud and all those kinds of things. No, we have to talk about the greatness of Allah, call people towards Allah. With yabaka fatahir, and to cleanse your clothes. And I'm not going to go into a deep tafsir here, but tiab here, people take as your libas, your clothing. Right? And no doubt that is included that a Muslim, a da'i, should be clean from najasa, should be well in his dress and all of that. But Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziyah as he said, he said the jumhur of the salaf, they took this to mean to cleanse your heart. This is from a bab of tafsir. That this was a statement of the Arab and the Zahir of it. That this means to clean your heart from showing, from riyah, from hasad, from jealousy, from shuh, as we heard in the khutbah, yeah? from uh, shirk, from bid'ah, from all these, from, from bukhal, from yani, being a coward, from all these things that, that, that go in the heart to cleanse from that. Right? And it's not an either or. Both meanings are applicable here, right? Until, and I'm not going to go, again, like I said, I'm not trying to go into tafsir here, but until li rabbika fasbir. And for your rabb, be patient. With all of this, don't forget about being patient in the, in the mission that you have. Wahi now starts. And there are three ways of wahi. And we'll end with this, inshallah. Three ways of wahi. One is directly from Jibreel alayhi salam, and then that has two subcategories. Right? Meaning Jibreel alayhi salam comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa One way is apparently. You see Jibreel, and the Sahaba saw Jibreel alayhi salam in his human form. Right? They saw like the famous hadith where they saw him come and they said he wasn't a resident of Medina and he had no signs of travel. You know, we saw that he wasn't a, like a Bedouin from coming with dust. And he walked in. Clean clothes, I mean, and he's not from Medina. We, Medina is a small city, everybody knew each other. So they saw Jibreel alayhi salam. And many other times during battles, the Sahaba who saw Jibreel alayhi salam, who saw the Malaika. So one is he would come apparently. And he came to the Prophet sallam, in his actual form, and he came to him in the form of a human. The second is where Jibreel alayhi salam would not be seen, but he would bring the wahi ala qalb al nabi alayhi salam, upon the heart of the Prophet. Sallam. That's all in one category. That is from Jibreel. That's some two subcategories. The second, from dreams. Directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The dreams of the anbiya, of the, of the prophets are wahi. Our dreams could be good, could be bad, could be confused thoughts. There is a part of wahi that still comes, but that is not 100%. Meaning if me and you see a dream, there is no ahkam from it. Even if it was a great... People are like, oh, this sheikh saw a dream to make this dhikr. No, 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 no. That sheikh's dream can be stay with himself. Stop forwarding those WhatsApp messages. Stop. <laughs> this is... This is really, no, don't post that. This is not the sharia. We don't base the sharia on ulema's dream or awliya's or anybody's. The only dreams that are 100% guaranteed are the anbiya. If the Sahaba saw a dream and the Prophet ﷺ confirmed it, then that's a, that's, a, that's a hujjah. If not, even that's not a hujjah. Okay? And the last is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to the Prophet ﷺ directly. Directly. Like in Al-Isra wal-Mi'raj. 
where Allah SWT spoke to the Prophet Wasallam. The last point I will make, when I say wahi, I do not mean just the Qur'an. Many a hadith where Jibreel alayhi salam would bring ahkam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that are not in the Quran, but rather those are preserved in ahadith. Okay? And inshallah, we'll continue with the revelation of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the beginning of the da'wah in Mecca at the next dars by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.